conference, we're now moving into the first of this afternoon's debates on health and care. I ask you to quieten down a bit, please, as you're moving. Thank you. Can I now welcome Erin McCauley, one of our young members. Erin is a Gordon Aikman Future Leaders Programme participant and a proud trade unionist. Erin, thank you. Uh, no pressure then, uh, having to do this after Jeremy Corbyn's just spoke. Uh, conference, it's a dark thought to think what our country would be like without our National Health Service. Visionary in its goal, revolutionary in its effects, our NHS is a piece of real socialism. But our, our NHS has faced and continues to face systematic undervaluing of its core aims. For far too long, our health service has been under-resourced and underfunded. For far too long, the NHS staff who make our health service function have been overworked and underpaid. And for too long, the staff all across our health service, their voices and concerns in the workplace have been undermined and neglected. But we shouldn't be fooled that when the Tories in Westminster and the SNP in Holyrood speak of reorganisation and reform, what they really mean is fragmentation, centralisation and privatisation of our services. <laughs> Conference last year we passed a motion advocating for parity of esteem between physical health and mental health. Sadly, we do live in a society where it seems so accepting of any other body part of ours to break down other than our brain. And mental health is a very complex and wide issue, but it's undoubtedly one of the biggest challenges in our workplace and in our global world. Not everybody will have experienced a mental health illness or a mental health issue, but every single person has mental health, so it's an issue for us all. We should be proud of the progress that we've made as a country towards mental health, but we have a long way to go. Mental health problems are the leading cause of absence from work. Tragically, suicide is now the biggest killer for men under 50 in the UK. In Scotland, the number of children and young people who, who have made suicidal calls to Childline has reached record highs. One in three children and our schools will have battled with a mental health problem by the age of 16. And NHS figures, along backed up with uh, charities as well, has shown that thousands of Scottish young people, despite being referred to the mental health um, system by their GP, were rejected. Now, as a country, we don't know, first of all, why these young people, thousands of young people, were rejected uh, to CAMS, and second of all, what has actually happened to these, these young people. Um, and there are so many devastating statistics that I could list off here today um, to highlight the mental health crisis that we have in Scotland. But behind these tragic statistics are people. I first began developing an eating disorder when I was 13 and throughout my whole teenage life had ba have battled bouts of depression. So I know our mental health system all too well. And yes, today I do campaign for mental health vigorously and I can speak about my experience, but that's not always been the case. Because I know what it's like to live in shame and in fear and embarrassment of not feeling okay in your head or be scared that people will judge you for feeling that way. What it feels like to accept that you're ill, go for the support and then be left on a lengthy waiting list for months and months. And I know what it's like to be told that you don't look depressed or you don't look like an eating disorder because you don't fit the societal expectations of what mental health is supposed to look like. And I know what it's like to have missed days off your work because you've wanted to take your life, but you don't, it's not something that you want to have a conversation with your boss about, or you fear that you might lose your job or be discriminated from the workplace, or that you won't be taken seriously. So the mental health strategy was published last year by the government is on the right track. But let me tell you this, Scotland's young people are facing a mental health epidemic and they deserve so much more 
than empty sound bites from our politicians. <laughs> so for a 10 year long strategy, it didn't only lack detail, but it lacked ambition. Ambition to be bold and bridge gaps in our services. The non-existence of a dedicated young adult mental health service right across the UK is a major flaw in our system. Because for those between 16 to 25, the issue of which service best suits their needs is problematic. The mental health needs of young adults is different and distinct from both children and adults. Too many people, and I've experienced this myself, have lost, get lost in transition um, or when they're moving from the children's service to the adult service. So urgent action is needed to address this gap. The introduction of a young adult mental health service or allowing children the option to stay in CAMS till the age of 25 could help bridge those gaps. <laughs> so I'm very pleased that throughout Richard's whole campaign and indeed as him as a leader, he did commit to considering the introduction of a young adult mental health service and as a party we have advocated for a long time for uh, young people to stay in the CAM system to the age of 25. Conference, the SNP have repeatedly said that closing the attainment gap is one of their top priorities. The attainment gap has become a, another buzzword for actually failing to address the deeply rooted problems in Scottish society because the reality is that this so-called attainment gap starts and continues well beyond the school gates. It's an issue that can never be closed and won't ever be closed by schools and teachers alone. <laughs> but if your children and young people's mental health is not okay, if it's not been sufficiently supported, then how can we expect our children and young people's grades to be? If as a country we are serious about closing this education attainment gap, then we need to get it right for children and young people's mental health. Because in a time of crisis amongst young people, it's shameful that uh, the government have failed to ring fence children and young people's mental health and failed to give our local authorities the funding they need to invest in counsellors in every school. And they should be ashamed of themselves for not doing that. Conference here in the city of Dundee, recent statistics have shown that there is a drug death crisis. The scale of drug deaths uh, here in Dundee is greater than anywhere else in the UK, and by far the, the greatest death rate in the European Union. But more widely, drug-related deaths and drug misuse has doubled over the past decade. As tragic as this is, drug misuse and drug-related problems is not a new problem to Scotland. And as others in this hall will know, having to watch people that you love battle with drug misuse is by no means a spectator sport. Drugs don't only impact on the user, but they impact on the wider family and their community. There's no one singular reason or one singular cause why someone might turn to drugs, and there's no singular solution. And watching people in my own life battle with drug misuse I've learned that a major player in preventing these drug-related deaths and giving people who are misusing drugs recovery is a sense of purpose and a sense of security in their life. Because without a clear and secure strategy into employment, without that social, that mental and that emotional support, then it's going to be very difficult for someone who is misusing drugs to recover. Putting addicts on methadone without no other means of support and expecting them to recover will most likely never work. <laughs> drug misuse and these drug related deaths are so much more than the drug taking alone and we need to change the debate on drugs in Scotland because for far too long it's not just been very far down the political agenda but it's been treated solely as a criminal issue, when in fact, drugs is a health and a social care issue too. But you don't prevent 
drug-related deaths or a mental health crisis in Scotland by slashing council budgets. You can't tackle a wide range of health and social care inequalities that prevail in uh, your society by starving public services with an austerity-driven agenda. And despite the challenges that our health services face, I am generally so thankful that we have one and uh, grateful for those who fought for his existence. But like many, I do fear for its future. And there are some who are quite happy to see our NHS privatise and they tell us that we can't afford their NHS anymore. But the truth is, we can't afford not to have an NHS. And that's like why, like everybody else in this room and beyond, eh, I'm utterly determined to fight for a Labour government because we do have the policies and we have the ideas and I generally have the hope that Labour can change the situation that our health service is in. Long before my time, healthcare was for the privileged few. People fought for it then. We must fight for it again now for its protection, so that healthcare forever remains in the hands of the many, not the few. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Conference, can I now welcome Anna Sarwar, MSP, Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, to open the debate. Anna. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Conference. Can I start by thanking Erin McCauley for what was a truly inspirational speech. A brave, strong, honest, young Labour woman speaking from her heart about her Labour values, about her experiences, and not wanting just change for herself, but change for the society that she lives in. That's the Labour Party, brothers and sisters, and that's why we need a Labour government. Because this year marks the 70th anniversary of the Labour government's creation of our National Health Service. Now, going back to what you've heard from the SNP over the last couple of years, they may have you try to believe that maybe they created it. Well, we should never shy away from being clear that it is a Labour achievement and the most cherished public service that we have. And today in Scotland, it employs 160,000 staff, 160,000 of our fellow citizens who every day do their best to care for patients, increasingly in more pressured circumstances. So to each and every one of them, some of them in this room today, let's send a loud Labour message of thank you Thank you for your service, thank you for your commitment, and thank you for making the NHS what it is. The conference, our thanks is not enough. What our NHS and social care staff need is not just warm words and platitudes, but support and action. Because all is not well with our National Health Service. And I must stress, that is despite the efforts of our NHS staff, not because of their efforts. They have been let down by a decade of mismanagement and complacency by this SNP government. A decade with no meaningful workforce plan, resulting in a recruitment and retention crisis. Let's not forget that it was Nicola Sturgeon who cut the training places for nurses and midwives when she was health secretary. For that, she should be ashamed. And that has contributed to us having record levels of vacancies. Over 2,000 nurses short in our NHS. Over 800 GPs short, with one in four GP practices recording a vacancy. Consultant vacancies at record levels and all the while the private agency bill goes up, up, 
and up. Too few staff, too much pressure, too little resources. Conference, last year I announced that after seven years of pay restraint, meaning a real terms pay cut for NHS staff, that Labour would begin the campaign to scrap the pay cap. Well, Conference, we have prevailed. The scrap the cap pay cap, the scrap the pay cap campaign, led by the trade unions, won the argument and the pay cap will now be lifted. But, but Labour has been clear that this must be funded by using our tax powers, not by job losses or cuts to public services. But the pressure isn't just on our staff. We are seeing it impact on patient care and services too. Record waiting times for treatment. Cancer diagnosis taking longer. a &E departments struggling. Our NHS staff and our patients deserve better. Conference, do you remember the television debate before the last Scottish Parliament election? When Nicola Sturgeon went on the television and denied there were any plans to close the REH children's ward? When she looked in the face of a local resident and promised she would keep it open? Well, she lied. That ward closure is now confirmed and we have a community betrayed. And now local people know that they can't trust the SNP and Nicola Sturgeon with our NHS. And that's why at the next Scottish Parliament election, we will make Paisley a Labour gain. And at the next Westminster election, we will make Paisley and Renfrewshire South a Labour gain so we can help return a Labour First Minister and a Labour Prime Minister working for local people. But we know it's not just about exposing the government's failures. We've also got to come up with the solutions. On the workforce crisis, bringing on board the expertise and experience of the likes of Dave Watson of Unison, John Marr of the GMB, and our other independent commissioners, Scottish Labour has launched our own workforce commission, working in partnership with the health and social care sector, staff, trade unions, and the public to build a workforce for the 21st century. On the resource crisis, delivering a progressive tax system to fully fund and resource our NHS and social care system. And on mental health, Scottish Labour will ring fence mental health budgets to ensure the resources reach the front line where they're needed the most. But we will also go further and guarantee access to school-based counselling for every pupil in Scotland. <laughs> we, will restore, we will restore the bursaries for education psychologists and we will develop a programme of mental health training for all staff in schools and those, devolve, those involved in delivering education. But I want us to go further. I want us to deliver guaranteed access to mental health support in every college and university campus and workplaces across our country. Because there is a common theme across all portfolios, inequality. That is why we will ensure a health inequality impact assessment is undertaken on every single policy put forward by every public authority in Scotland. A Labour Scottish Government with a mission to fight inequality at its heart, not an afterthought. That's the NHS we want to see. That's the NHS Scottish Labour will deliver. And that's why we need a Scottish Labour government. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Anas and thanks um, for all the work that you're doing in, in Holyrood in, in this important area. Conference, we're now going to consider Contemporary Resolution 3 on mental health in the workplace, which has been submitted by Community Union. Can I now ask the mover of Contemporary Motion 3 to come forward to the rostrum, and if the seconder could come just up to the side of the stage to be ready. Thank you. <coughs> Conference, Stephen McGuck. Community Union, 
moving our motion, mental health in the workplace. Comrades, for many of us, work is a major part of our lives. It's where we spend the majority of our time, where we get our, own, our income, and often where we make our friends. It's also inevitably a setting where we experience problems, a majority of, a majority of which these are mental health problems. Confidence, more people are in work with a mental health condition than ever before, and that's across all workplaces and all ages. But without the necessary help and support, many of these workers are struggling, and as a consequence are off sick, are less productive, and are leaving work. In any one year, over one in four people in the general population, and one in six are likely one in six workers are likely to be suffering from a, a mental health condition. With over 31 million people in work in the UK, this is the equivalent to over 5 million workers suffering from a mental health condition. But due to stigma, lack of knowledge, training and support on how to support our friends and colleagues in the workplace, those millions of workers are being left to deal with men their mental health issues alone and in silence. The total number of working days lost due to work-related stress, anxiety and depression reached 9.9 .9 million days, and in many cases the days lost became the end of employment. In fact, as many as 300,000 people with long-term mental health conditions leave employment every year. That's 300,000 people leaving their income, stability and colleagues behind. Conference, to put that in perspective, that's almost the equivalent to the whole population of our capital city, Edinburgh. But this extends beyond our workplaces because it starts in our schools, homes and communities, and for some before the age of 15. Around one in 10 children and young people are affected by mental health problems, and 70% of those young people fail to get support they desperately need. That means we are seeing the majority of young people entering the workforce without the help, support and stability they require to start a meaningful career for their futures. Conference, good mental health needs and must be a priority for the workplace, every workplace, because good work is good, for good, is good for mental health, and good mental health is good for our workers and their families, our economy and society. But when it comes to action, the SNP have come nowhere near the scale of ambition we need for improving our mental health in Scotland, especially in the workplace. They ignored our calls for school-based counselling and early intervention support, and their plans for mental health in the work are close to non-existent. And across the UK, the government funding for mental health just scratches the surface when looking at the scale of the problem. Waiting times can be as long as a year and over two years for specialist support and employers aren't equipped or trained to develop mental health awareness and support employees. Conference, we are the party for workers, so let's lead the way in mental health in our workplaces and tackle mental health at work so we don't see the equivalent to a population of our capital city leaving the workforce, and instead provide support to workers that need, they need to, support, to thrive. Please support this motion. Thank you. Conference, comrades, Matt Murray Unison, and proud to second this motion as a mental health officer and a member of the mental health tribunals. Unlike physical health, you can't see mental health. We are in a bit drawn, the wee bit withdrawn the days, a bit of a curmudgeon, blah de blah. Nobody stops and says, Are they depressed? They're a bit high today, they're a bit hyper, etc. etc. Nobody stops to think, are they actually manic? And that's part of the problem we have in the workplace now. We don't have a system of mental health first aid to the extent we have in 
secondary issues like broken bones or cuts or anything else. You can see them. You can't see in somebody's head, unfortunately. I'm minded of a Hector Nicol situation because mental health can get you down. No pun intended. When he talked of two guys sitting at the poolside and one says to the other, what's the water like? He says, it's look warm. So the guy jumps in. He says, it's fucking freezing. He says, it'll look warm to me. So <laughs> that is what happens when you take things at face value, comrades. That is what mental health's like. I'm limping about the place because I'm arthritic. Nobody stops and says, he's not very sociable because he's depressed. But however, I can talk from not only a professional point of view, and I have been responsible for putting many, many people in hospital for treatment. <laughs> yes, guilty. <laughs> there are many, many people walking about who I would not otherwise have been had I not taken that decision. However, I want you to cast your mind back to just before Christmas, 1988. Because I can. And I was sitting with my then two-year-old daughter reading a book. And I was reading a book called The Faraway Tree. Now, how does that stick 30-odd years later? Because halfway through that book, I got a phone call. I was at that time chair of Welfare Rights Services in Dumfries. And I was the secretary of NALGO. Martin, can we open up welfare rights? There's been a plane crash at Walker Bay. Aye, says I, no problem. Thinking somebody's come down in a private plane. 20 minutes later, the chief executive phones. Martin, can you authorise troops to come out and work? And we'll settle over time later on. There's been a, crew, a plane crash. Fast forward four hours. And I'm in Dante's Inferno. I'm talking as a player who played under floodlights, a bit like today. Three feet either side, pitch black. In the middle, blazing. Part of my responsibility was to help identify people killed in Lockerbie. Part of that job involved looking at bits of people. That stuck with me for the next 30 years. They finally diagnosed PTSD and through treatment, I myself am now cured of the trauma of every Christmas being the biggest curmudgeon you've ever seen. Because people thought, he doesn't want to come, he doesn't want to play, he's not interested, etc., etc. Because I had that loop playing, and that loop got longer and longer and longer. But nobody can see it. You do. You can smell it. PTSD is horrendous. And the frightening thing is that at my age, and my, I'm now over 50, that that highest level of deaths among males over 50 is not cancer, it's suicide. That is a frightening concept, comrades, and it's something that we have got to tackle in the workplace because most people over the age of 50 are still in the workplace. We need to be able to identify them, get them help, and be able to know where we're at and where they're at, and they're not just socially withdrawn. We need first aiders in the same way as we have them, if you saw them with a broken leg or a bad cut, that you would intervene and help them. We need to be able to support that so that we can keep people at work, stop people losing jobs, as my comrade has just said earlier, and make the workplace a healthier place to be. So please, if you can, support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Th thanks for that. Um, two, two very good speeches to get things started there. Um, can I see a show of hands from people who, who are interested in coming in in the, this, this debate? Um, quite, quite a number there. Okay, I'm going to try and get as many of you in as I possibly can, so bear that in mind. Please do stick to the, the, the time limits that we've got. I'm going to start off taking three, and uh, we'll take it from there. Start off at this side, yourself at the back there, and you. Have we got one more at this side here? Yes. 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 
If you could come across to this side here. Hello, uh, my name is Caroline Davidson. I'm a Labour Council councillor from Paisley CLP, and this is my first time speaking at conference. <laughs> conference, I wanted to come in in this debate to talk to you about the children's ward at Royal Alexandra in my hometown of Paisley, Ward 15, as mentioned previously by Annis. You might remember that Nicola Sturgeon was asked about it during the TV debate. She looked at the camera and answered a direct question of Ward 15 from Gordon Clark of Paisley. You know what she said? There are no particular plans to close that ward. In spite of assurances conference, just a few weeks ago, Shona Robertson announced the ward would shut after all. And the service has now been transferred to the Royal Hospital for Children in Nicola Sturgeon's govern. But conference is a silver lining. It's the reason I joined the, the Labour Party and it's the reason I stood for and won the Renfrewshire elections last year. Seven years ago, I wouldn't have believed you if you told me that today I'd be a member of the Labour Party, let alone speaking at conference. But I'm here today because of all the fantastic support that we've had from Scottish Labour. Seven years ago, together with other local parents, we formed the Kids Need Our Ward campaign to fight for local paediatric services in Paisley. I guess most of you know this already, but you can't be involved in a community campaign without having to realise that the SNP will do and say anything at all to avoid taking responsibility for their own actions. <laughs> I was constantly told I was making it all up. I was constantly told that I was just scaremongering. The local SNP MSP in Paisley, his idea of fighting to protect local services is campaigning to keep a McDonald's fast food restaurant open in the high street. He hasn't once did anything to protect the children's ward. He hasn't once spoken out for the families who will now have to take two buses for emergency care and whose children's lives depend on Ward 15. He hasn't once shown any concern for the staff or the downgrading of the RAH which will inevitably follow. Let me ask you this conference, what's more important for families in a community like Paisley? A brilliant local hospital where you have seven days a week access to dedicated paediatric staff? Or a place where you have seven days access to Happy Meals? <laughs> but it's not just the MSP, it's the local Paisley MP also. You remember her? She's the one who's in Parliament so rarely that she has to put it on YouTube every time she bothers to turn up. Maybe if she spent less time trying to get likes on Facebook and a little more time speaking to local people, she would have noticed just how important our NHS is. And isn't that the difference between Labour and the SNP? The SNP are only concerned about having to take responsibility for their 10 years in power, while Labour is concerned in making communities better and better. It's been an incredible journey for me these last seven years, and no matter how disappointed we were in the decision, we aren't finished yet. We'll keep campaigning. We'll fight to protect local services. And the sooner we have Jeremy Corbyn in number 10 and Richard Leonard as First Minister, the sooner we can deliver the many, not the few. Thank you, Conference. Chair, Conference, Martin McCluskey, Community Union uh, and Chair of Breda Kidinberclyde, CLP. Um, a lot of the themes I'm about to speak about are going to have a lot in common with the speech that you've just heard from the colleague from, from Paisley. More than um, two years ago, I stood at this conference and warned of the threat to NHS services in Inverclyde. 
our maternity services were at risk, uh, repairs on our hospital building were being delayed and patients were waiting longer and longer for outpatient treatment. Now, I wish I could stand here today and say that things have got better, but they haven't. Our maternity services remain at risk and cuts are still on the table, with that coming back in March. The demand by Unison at Inverclyde Royal and others to reclad the hospital and to upgrade the fabric of the building has been ignored, and waiting times for outpatient services get longer and longer. Just last week, someone was telling me about a four-month wait for a really simple echocardiogram. Conference, time and again, we in Labour have warned about the threat to Inverclyde Royal Hospital, and time and again, we get the same response from the SNP. They say we're scaremongering and they call us liars. That's what they did to Siobhan McCready when she was our candidate in 2016. It's what they did to me when I stood in the general election last year. It's what they do to Anas every single week in the Scottish Parliament. It's what they did to Neil Bibby in Paisley and to Paula Kane in Renfrewshire South when they said the children's ward at the RAH was under threat. And what's happening to that ward today, as we've just heard, it's months from closure after a decision by the SNP Health Minister. Conference, it is the lowest form of politics to promise one thing during an election and do the exact opposite after you win. But that's exactly, exactly what Nicola Sturgeon did when she said there were no plans to close Ward 15 at the RAH. She betrayed the people who rely on that ward and showed that we can't trust the SNP to secure our local health services. Conference, we want a serious debate about our NHS. We're not running away from that because its future needs to be secured for the next generation. But we can't do that if this government behaves with this level of dishonesty, saying one thing before an election and then doing something totally different months after. Conference, we should never back down from defending our NHS, even when the attack is. We need to continue to speak up for the thousands of health workers across Scotland who are underpaid, undervalued, and under-resourced and stand with the trade unions who are arguing against health service cuts and for a proper pay increase. We need, as Anas has said, proper workforce planning so that in the future we can avoid the ridiculous situation where our NHS is being cut but at the same time we're spending more than ever on locums and agency staff. And we need to invest in the social care system to end the disgrace that sees hundreds of people dying while they're waiting to be discharged from hospital. Conference, the only way to achieve this is with a Labour government in Scotland running the NHS led by Richard Leonard and a Labour government across the UK ending Tory austerity under Jeremy Corbyn. We've had enough of the SNP saying everything is fine because we're doing better than England. We shouldn't be bothered about whether we're just doing better than England. We've also had enough of being accused of talking down our NHS and we've had enough of the voices of NHS workers being ignored over and over and over again. For our nurses, for our doctors, for our care workers and for our patients, let's deliver a Labour government that will give Scotland the best health service in the world. Thank you. Okay, before our next speaker, please, please come up. And while um, you're waiting, could I just see an indication of other people wishing to speak? Yourself there, here and here in the front row. And I'll come to some others next. Thank you. Chair, Conference, Councillor Marion Donaldson, Leith Walk, Edinburgh. Labour in power, that sounds great, doesn't it? Labour in power, able to put our values in place, will make a difference for our NHS in Scotland. I'm a councillor in local government in Edinburgh and previously I worked as a pharmacist and yesterday in Leith I met with enthusiastic pharmacists to discuss and further develop community pharmacy schemes that are designed to take the pressure off general practice service. I strongly believe that projects like these which integrate health and community care are vital but taken on their own schemes like these are not enough. We need integration, yes, but we also need something else, hard cash, cold, hard cash. The current local government settlement is woefully inadequate. 
And I actually made this point in my speech as Vice Convener of the Finance Committee in Edinburgh when we set our budget last month. So the settlement is ad inadequate not only for social care delivery, but also for health care delivery. Every pound that does not get allocated to social care puts an extra burden on the NHS. In their budget allocation, the Scottish Government has been working on the Rob Peter to pay Paul principle. A chronically underfunded NHS gets slightly more money by diverting money from local government and social care. So what are the consequences of this? Suffering. People diverted into hospital who should be cared for in their own homes and an ever increasing burden on the staff who provide care in both the NHS and social care. These dedicated staff who continue to warn us that services cannot be regarded as safe while still doing their very best. So in Edinburgh, we are pledged to work with the trade unions to do the best we can to alleviate the burden that falls on both staff and their clients and which has such dire consequences for health and social care. But let us face reality. However closely we work together, however innovative we are, it will not be enough. We have to be totally honest with people. A future Labour government cannot solve the problem of overstretched services only by better management of resources and, in commun and increased community engagement. What is required is more resource, the kind of resource that is only generated by radical change in taxation policy. Also, let us spell it out. We need policies which encourage skilled workers from Europe to come to this country for our care services. So, when we are on the doorsteps, when we are campaigning for a better NHS, let us be clear. We are also campaigning for the increased and fairer taxation that is essential for making the be better NHS a reality. Without that honesty, we are offering a false prospectus. So conference, in this climate, climate of imposed austerity and cuts, we still do our very best for the people we represent. We still care and we still innovate. Think about how much more we could do if we were in power. Thank you. Rhea Wilson, Ammon Valley, CLP. I firstly want to show solidarity with our comrades fighting against hospital closures. In our local area, we face, face the closure of our and the indefinite closure of our children's ward at St John's Hospital. The campaign led by, uh, led by our incredible local MSP, Neil Finlay. But all we get is dishonesty, no facts, no accountability from the local SNP. Um, so solidarity on that issue. But today I want to talk about care. There's a fundamental incoherence in our society over how we organise care. We've built a country that relies on low paid and unpaid labour to function, and predominantly by women. Individuals take on essential care, and yet we allow these carers to be discriminated at their work as our laws fail to protect them. In my work, I've supported women who have been forced to leave disabled partners at home with no care for 12 hours in order to attend training for threat of losing their livelihoods. We must demand more radical change from our society. We need a national social care system that allows everyone the dignity of access to care. We need recognition of domestic labour, without which our society would come to a standstill overnight. For professional carers, underinvestment and cuts, to, uh, and cuts are destroying their ability to provide the most essential care. Just last week, home carers fought through the most treacherous conditions to ensure our most vulnerable were not abandoned at a point of crisis in Scotland. If it weren't for those individuals, those individual carers, the most vulnerable society, make no mistake, would have been abandoned. They would have been abandoned by this government who did not intervene when their intervention was so very necessary. But our con carers continue to work under the threat of kangaroo courts through the SSC. The demands from their employers to treat the elderly only through pit stop care 
and some of the lowest wages in the countries. Make no mistake, when we hear headlines about pay increases and pay caps being busted, this does not apply to our local government workers. It does not apply to our home carers. They, our home carers provide highly specialised professional care, but they don't have the wages to match. When we talk about investing in social care, our greatest resource are the frontline workers. Invest in them. A decent wage with shift patterns that allow people to live a decent life. I'll just end on this. I've had four minutes to address you today. As a frontline carer, I would have just 11 minutes left to provide the most essential personal care, washing, feeding, and providing medication for the client for whom I may be the only person they get to speak to that day. As another International Women's Day comes and goes, let's commit this year to seeing an end to the whole-scale workplace discrimination that sees female-dominated jobs left behind. A year for working women to rise up and to fight for a society that no longer leaves women and the elderly behind. Thank you. Good afternoon, comrades. I'm Bill Curran. I'm the membership secretary for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross constituency Labour Party. I'll get a cheap round of applause. <laughs> this is my first time addressing conference. It's my first time delegate conference. And my first time at conference. Hat trick. For 30 years, I was a psychiatric nurse. And the last time that I spoke to this many people, I was in London trying to get new P to come out on strike, which uh, somewhat dates me, because at the time I was a chairman of a, a Springfield cosy. The welfare state, the welfare state was the crowning glory of British socialism. The NHS is the jewel in the crown of the Labour Party. The Conservative government in Westminster and the Nats in Holyrood are deliberately trying to undermine our NHS so that they can steal it from us. They're stealing the crown jewels. And they want to do it to sell it to their grasping corporate cronies. The likes of, um, or oh, that well-known philanthropist Richard Branson, who took us to court just because he didn't make it to the contract. In the last couple of weeks, We've seen the results of a survey uh, that told us that it was a survey of National Health Board members and it told us that they are being routinely put under pressure to describe financial cuts as being necessary purely and simply for clinical reasons. This is not the case. In other situations, evidence given by experts about the possible dangers of cuts are being ignored, are being sidestepped, are being completely thrown away, being given in private, and nothing comes to light until a whistleblower steps forward and tells people that these things have been happening. This happened recently in Caithness. Our shadow comes, our shadow Cabinet Secretary for Health, uh, all the MSPs, those undertaking the reviews, the new work, Workforce Commission, can only work on the information that they are given. They are given this information by government. And what I'm here for today is to give a piece of advice to the Shadow Secretary, to the Workforce Commission, and that is well, in modern parlance, it's fact-check. What I would like to say is, if a Tory tells you something, don't believe it, take it with a massive pinch of salt. Thank you. Okay, before our next speaker starts, we should be able to fit in another couple. One here, and here. Like to come across to the side there and be ready but mo most of the time. That'll be my face on the screen now then. Uh, Lewis King, Kevin BCLP, not a first time delegate or a first time speaker, just to put that one in there. 
Um, conference, those of you who were here last year may recall my speech on young carers. Um, this year I'm actually going to stay on the subject of young people but moving away from young carers. Mental health is an issue that affects many young people. Research undertaken by the Mental Health Foundation show that 20% of adolescents may experience a mental health problem and 10% of children and young people have a clinically diagnosable mental health problem. And mental health can affect people in many different ways. And for too long, the shame, the guilt and the fear to speak out left people, and particularly young people, feeling isolated. That isolation can lock young people out of their future. From interfering with school worker studies to shrinking, so shrinking their social circle. But conference, in Richard's policy papers, we see something different. We see someone who has listened. His leadership campaign put forward radical alternatives that would improve the lives of vulnerable young people. We should be proud, Conference, that we now have a policy platform in place that outlines what Scottish Labour will be pushing for and also what, what a Scottish Labour, what Scottish Labour government will do when elected. Radical policies such as ring fencing mental health budgets to ensuring that the funding reaches the front line. Radical policies such as priority access for care experienced young people such as myself for services on the NHS including mental health services. Radical policies such as expanding access of concessionary travel to include young people, to include care experienced young people. Conference, these policies would make a huge difference in the lives of vulnerable young people. The conference, that's just a part of it. We must also begin to tackle the environment which can have a big impact on mental well-being. Low, a low wage economy that treats workers, especially young workers, is ten a penny. Employers who use zero hours contracts on our young workers because they have zero respect for our rights or our welfare. We have a society which is unequal and unforgiving, but with a Labour Party led by Jeremy Corbyn and Richard Leonard, we are offering a real change to that. So let's back them to deliver real change and back this motion on mental health at work. Thank you. Good afternoon, Conference, Chair and members of the SEC. My name is Fred Hessler, Edinburgh North and Leith Delegate, um, first time Delegate, first time Speaker. Thank you. I was a trained mental health nurse, um, like the previous Speaker, for 28 years, um, and I spent three years training in the, uh, in the Edinburgh Mental Health uh, Hospital. I did the tour of Scotland, went back 20 years later for a year on um, the, the, the nurse bank, and nothing had changed, except, well, one thing had changed, the casualization and the fragmentation of the workforce, the care assistants, the agency staff coming in at the last minute, uh, not knowing what was going on. They talk about recruitment and retention crisis. Well, if you retain quality staff and make their working lives better and the service that you provide a higher quality then the recruitment problem would go away. Um, the paper calls for controlling the use of nursing services obtained through private agencies. I was explaining this to our, our co-chair of the CLP um, before I came here and she was um, gobsmacked to learn that if, I, if I, I'd still retained my nursing uh, certificate, it has unfortunately lapsed now, but if I still retained it and received a call from a private nursing agency to go and take charge of an acute mental health inpatient facility in any one of the NHS hospitals in Scotland, I could expect to be paid £69.50 per hour from this agency on a public holiday or £40 an hour on a Sunday or a Saturday. Um, and that's what I would get paid, not what the agency would charge the NHS. So that's the scale of the, of the problem. I don't know how many millions we've wasted on paying private agencies. Why don't we just employ more nurses and train them? Turn, turning to the, the contemporary mo motion, um, just a, a caveat. Um, 
that it says to resolve to support existing trade union campaigns to improve mental health provision training. Training is the, the key to everything. People get training, they feel supported, they feel valued. They'll give a better version of themselves at their work. But it goes on to say, and attitudes in Scotland's workplaces. Well, attitudes are something you can't train people to change. You can't, you know, you can give people knowledge and they can learn skills. But attitudes come from a culture and that's up to us, all of us, in our daily lives, in our workplaces, to change, to inculcate a, a more welcoming and a more tolerant attitude towards mental health, um, which will benefit everybody, especially those who have the, the, the misfortune to suffer from a mental health issue. But yes, um, please support the motion, and uh, Richard Leonard is uh, the next Scottish Labour First Minister implementing these policies. Comrades, I had only asked one of you up to speak, but if both of you can guarantee to be very, very quick, I'll manage to put you both in before they finish. Remember the trap door. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity. Gareth Brown, Delegate from Remshire North and West, CLP. Uh, I'm really thankful to Community Union for lodging the motion and raising the profile of mental health is crucial for everyone. As someone who suffers from poor mental health from time to time, I'll be delighted to vote for the motion. I also want to praise Erin, who spoke earlier on for her honesty and emotional statement she gave uh, in describing her experiences. <laughs> mental health in the workplace affects not only the sufferer and their family and their colleagues, it negatively impacts their career opportunities and it costs our economy. For the government to be serious about investing in mental health services, more must be done to put it on a level uh, par with physical health spending, as we heard earlier on. Investing in mental health is to invest in our children and young people, our schools, colleges, universities, and our workforce. Now, I'm actually pretty fortunate to be in employment with a good employer, uh, a Labour MSP. You can tell her that for me. So, I really believe that a greater focus must be put on mental health services for those affected by infertility and bereavement as well and other hidden problems that aren't picked up on. As a proud father of a three-year-old conceived by IVF, I had to watch my wife suffer depression because of the strain that IVF causes. And this happens to many, many couples. One in six couples are affected by IVF and fertility problems. We also need to recognise the link between poverty and poor mental health. Estimates show that one in three GP appointments are for mental health issues. And it is believed that in more deprived communities, this is a higher figure. Investing more in mental health is an investment in tackling poverty and disadvantage. Conference, please support motion number three and commit our party to work with all to deliver better services for all of Scotland's people. Comrades, brothers and sisters, my name is Eddie Martin. I'm from Dunfermline CLP. This is my first speech to the conference and also my first time as a delegate. <laughs> I am pleased today to speak to you in support of the community's uh, motion regarding the need to address the more seriously the issue of promotion of support and good mental health in the workplace. I feel very passionately about this and I would like to see the inequality around it changed. There is rightly a concern about the growing increase in mental health issues and more needs to be done to address this and support those affected by it in the workplace. The latest Labour Force survey data states that in 2016 to 2017, 12.6 million, million days were lost to stress, anxiety and depression. In Scotland, 2015-2016, there were 846,000 people prescribed with antidepressants. The Health and Safety First Aid Regulations 1981 fails to mention the mental health of employees and focuses only on the physical health. Comrades, that needs to change. And I have a suggestion to help address that issue. It is the implementation and development of mental health first aiders in the workplace. This legislation should include mental health first aid within it. This lack of clarity is detrimental to a worker's well-being. There is more often a lack of expertise to deal with mental health issues in the workplace when they occur. Employers have a duty of care and should focus on a holistic approach to each person as a whole. 
focus on their ability, not their disability. We need people on site with training, knowledge and confidence to come to someone's aid if they are recognised as struggling with mental health issues. I saw a problem, so what did I do about it? In my role as an elected convener for the trade union in my workplace, I recognised that there was an issue and I approached my employer through the Mental Health, um, the health and Safety Committee about this. A joint approach between the employer and the trade union was agreed. A Mental Health Awareness Open Day was arranged. Our objectives were set as taking away the taboo, breaking down the barriers and challenging the stigma around mental health problems. Right now, barriers are being broken down, stigma around mental health are being challenged and being removed, and there is an acceptance that the subject can be spoken about. My employer is Alexander Dennis Limited, who manufactures the coach building. This is a predominantly male workforce, the very group who traditionally are reluctant to talk about mental health issues. Lots of people sought health and advice. The open day was deemed an overwhelming success and another one is planned for May to coincide with Mental Health Awareness Week. So what needs to happen and why? We need provision of trained mental health first aiders. Our goal is to see mental health first aiders in the workplace. The current Scottish Government mental health strategy has 40 action points to work to in the next 10 years. Only one of these action points relates to mental health in the workplace. One, action 36, work with employers on how they can act to protect and improve mental health and support employers experience poor mental health. Point 36 out of 40, that's how far down the priority list this issue really is. Comrades, we need a stronger, more robust commitment from conference here today and the Labour Party as a whole to tackle this issue more robustly. This approach should be integral to all companies. It would not only help those who may suffer from mental health issues, but would also educate all employees, thus reducing the real reality of stigma that surrounds mental health diagnosis. Comrades, please support this motion. Shadow Minister for Health to close the debate. And if ever there was a temptation to use the trap door, we've got an opportunity. Thank you, Chair. Before I start, can I just say how proud I am of Linda chairing the conference today and ask you to thank her for her work. Uh, Conference David Stewart, MSP, Shadow Minister of Health. On the 5th of July 1948, Sylvia Beckenham was admitted to hospital for a liver condition. A big event in her life, but an even bigger event in British history. The 13-year-old was the first ever patient to be treated by the National Health Service. The NHS, our NHS, will be 70 in July. Our party created the health service. And three score years and ten, we are still defending it. When Nye Bevan launched the NHS at the Park Hospital Manchester, he faced a furious war on three fronts. From the Tories in Westminster, that's right, conference, the same old Tories. From a hardcore band of consultants and from the then chair of the British Medical Association. But conference, as you all know, he succeeded over the teeth of strong opposition. What an achievement, a national health service the jewel in the crown of the post-war Labour government. The uniting of all the hospitals and doctor surgeries to a state-run service was groundbreaking in the Western world. I faced with an early shortage of nurses in 1948, a familiar story today conference, Bevan pushed up their wages to attract recruits, a solution I would strongly recommend today to the Scottish government. Conference the 1960s saw the first British heart and liver transplants, the first kidney transplant to place in Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. The 1970s saw the first test tube baby and CT scans, which revolutionized the way that doctors examined patients. Now conference, as all the other speakers have said, I am proud and they are proud to belong to a party with that 70 year old pedigree. 
but confidence I'm even prouder still of the NHS's hard-working frontline staff, the junior doctors, the nurses, the midwives, the consultants, the GPs, the allied health professionals, the porters and receptionists. Conference, let's applaud the work they do for us. <laughs> but conference, despite their hard work and commitment, we face challenges which have been touched on in this debate. Our ageing population, pressures in social care, the need for robust workforce planning now and post-Brexit, and a growing mental health crisis. And as other speakers, could I compliment Erin McCauley for her excellent speech earlier on. <laughs> and the first class speeches by our comrades from Community Unison and the constituencies. The nature of these public health challenges may look modern conference, but under the surface, the root causes are the same old story. Poverty, social deprivation, inequality are significant contributors to poor health expectations and it's the least well off who are most at risk. Now back in 1948 the NHS resented the advantage of egalitarianism to our nation. There was great hope for the new future it heralded but a Guardian news article at the time said the changes were designed to offset as far as they can the inequalities that arises from the chances of life. Illness, accident, loss of work should not carry the heavy crippling economic penalty it's carried in the past. Inequality in health was a serious issue then, and it sadly remains a serious issue now. Life expectancy in the UK has stalled, and in recent years, the chasm between health outcomes of the rich and the poor has widened. Is that an outrage conference? Then our 21st century, individuals' health expectations are intrinsically linked to their postcode, but our health inequalities are in fact a symptom a symptom of wider social inequalities that can never be solved by the NHS alone. Surely the key conference for our movement is to dismantle the social economic inequalities which see the most disadvantaged die younger than those in more affluent suburbs. Now take our modern day public health crisis, rising obesity. We all know obesity is the second cause of cancer after smoking, but 10% of all UK children aged four to five arrive at school already overweight. This is a problem that's not unique to us conference, international in scope. Over one third of US adults have pre-diabetes and Scotland has one of the worst obesity records in the OECD. Now a recent article in the British Medical Journal was headlined, why do the couch, the television and the car appear more than the park, the gym and the bike? The Scottish Government's new strategy focuses on making healthy food choices easier, but individual food choices alone cannot explain the fact that a quarter of all children living in the most deprived areas are at risk of obesity. Conference is very fine and easy to talk about active travel, but what if it's not safe to walk or cycle in your local neighbourhood? And it's fine to talk about healthy eating, but what if you cannot buy fresh fruit and veg from your local shop due to rising food prices? And it's fine to promote a balanced lifestyle, but what if you're working on a minimum wage zero hour contract and you need to grab a fast food dinner during your split shift. And mental health, the topic of the motion in the debate, is also impacted by social and economic factors. People living in the most deprived areas are twice as likely to report common mental health problems compared to the least deprived. Conference to be serious about improving the health expectation of all our citizens means to be determined to eradicating poverty in Scottish communities. Richard Leonard understands that, Scottish Labour understands that, the trade union movement understands that. That's why tacking health inequalities is the heart of our health, indeed all of our policy debate. All we need, conference, is the will to do and the soul to dare.